for the last uh, lecture, lecture we have in our time series database. So I just want to qu read some quick emails that I've gotten from people that have been watching these videos on YouTube and they sort of have some suggestions and praise for us. So Justin L. in Seattle says, thank you for posting the time series lectures on YouTube. I have really learned a lot. Evan J. in Brooklyn, New York says, hey Andy, great time series database YouTube videos, keep them coming. And the last one is Samuel M. in Newton, Massachusetts says, I don't know how you can call these time series lectures without having time scale DB. You need to have them come give a talk. That's the best time series database out there. I was able to track my ex's location in near real time with a tra GPS transponder I put in their car. They don't know it's there, and now I know everywhere they go and find out why they're going on all these co coffee dates with people from Tinder. Timescale DB is the only system that will uh, allow me to scale and allow me to, to track my ex uh, in that manner. So, and with that said, and this is why we, we invited Mike at the last, because this is you know, the one we're very excited about. Uh, so Mike Freeman is a pr uh, professor at Princeton University in the computer science department. And he's the co-founder and former CEO, but now CTO of yeah. Timescale. Yes, it says there. Uh, and so he's here to talk about Timescale DB. So go for it. And yes, it looks bad that the screen is stuck. At some point, it may magically come down, but some point it may not. <laughs> yeah, I think I think one of our big selling points is uh, is native geospatial support, yes. uh, which is particularly useful for um, tracking. tracking people. Yeah. Uh, um, we have, no, we have no liability based on how people use the database. Anyway, thank you for having me. Um, what I wanted to talk to you today, I, I'm, I'm actually here to the database group. Um, I am uh, academically not a database researcher. I am a systems researcher. And uh, yeah, this side of the room, um, these are my friends. Yeah, you know, we'll see. I, I, play one, I play one during the day. Uh, this, you did, no, absolutely. Andy's all, Andy is dope. Andy is dope. Um, today I want to talk about basically our experience uh, building Timescale uh, on top of Postgres. We actually started as an IoT company in building basically performing a platform as easy to uh, collect, store, analyze data. And in building, uh, we tried a number of the open source databases on the market uh, that are available. Um, I'm not going to name names. Uh, but in general, we were uh, unsatisfied with their, what there was. So we built one ourselves. And uh, eventually, we really decided to focus on really bringing this, uh, letting other people use this database and open source it. And kind of that's what I want to talk about. So this kind of arose from our experience with IoT. But what we found is kind of time series data is much broader. In particular, um, in this, awesome. <laughs> when I got to the, the meat of the talk, there you go. Um, and so what's interesting, and I think in this series, you actually had people from KDB. You had people from Influx, and you see over the time, time series databases specialized for certain areas. So KDB came out of finance, uh, Influx and others came out of DevOps, but we also see time series data emerging in many places from transportation and logistics, from IoT and predictive maintenance, from web and mobile eventing. And you know, what they need across many of these places is time, data is being generated at a high rate, and we need a better way to sort analyze it. And there's a couple major trends that's causing this. One of them is what we call really the evolution of data resolution. So think of the, your bank. Your bank historically basically just kept the last state of the world. You could view this as the only thing the bank kept was a materialized view of the state of the database. But over time, we switched to keeping every state of the world. Now, banking transactions, it's probably not surprising that you keep track of all the transactions. But think of logistics. It's different from knowing where are my containers now versus where is every place that my container has been over time. To the future where we're basically going to be storing every interaction. So as you go along this path, basically you're collecting finer and finer resolution data. You're collecting more and more data. And this becomes a more of a systems, a scale problem. And so we could ask, I, I've used the term time series data. And I guess I'm at the last, the last person in this long series, so hopefully you also have, a, you have some notion of what time series data is. But it's interesting in that people in different areas often use different language that reflects actually kind of if they came from, let's say, DevOps, they have a particular definition of what they think of time series data. So broadly speaking, we could think of this as data being collected from a bunch of different things or financial securities or instruments. It's collected over time. And you might store different stuff. So a common scenario, for example, is just a type of IoT application where you have a bunch of measurement data like the average CPU, some time value, and some additional metadata about that information. 
Now, this is one view. You could call this a narrow view. A lot of time series database describes how many time series they have. And when they describe time series, what they really mean is what is the unique combination of metadata or tags. And we are going to define each of these unique combinations as one time series. So this itself would be, let's say, 15 different time series, all unique combinations of these tags. And this is often the cardinality problem of time series that you hear some people talk about. But of course, this doesn't only have narrow, it could be wide, so you could keep many information about that. And the relational model often helps. For example, if I'm tracking container ships and my temperature is quite high, it's actually useful to know that, in fact, what's happening is I'm actually picking up waste heat from my CPU. So being able to maintain this relationship between these different columns actually turns out to be very useful in certain scenarios, as well as combine it with additional metadata. So for example, we might often keep more information, if this is again containers, you know, it's actually useful to know that this in fact is a 45, uh, 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 a uh, shipping container, a refrigerated container of 40 feet, because in fact, the, 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 you know, the high temperature of my refrigerating container, that's the bad sign. And so if you look at this model, this actually fits very natural with the relational model. But, you know, what most time series databases don't want to deal with this stuff, because they don't want to deal with joins, or they might denormalize it all at insert time. And so what ultimately happens is, when you see the deployment of many of these time series databases in practice, typically you find that the metadata often gets pushed to a separate relational data, and they often join this in application space. Now, this says, oh, whatever, I have to write some glue code. What this operationally need is now that your data analysts say, hey, I want to ask this question, what they actually do is have to wait two months in order to get into an engineering sprint so that the application code be changed to now support this joint application space. And I think I'm going to get a lot of questions here, but Gar, yeah. Many of our time series people have assumed an important property, and maybe even a definitional property, is that old data is less valuable than new data. Um, first of all, I want to know if you agree with that. And second of all, does it impact these related tables as well? Uh, uh, repeat the question. Uh, the question was, is old data less important than new data? Um, let me just, why don't I talk about this a little bit later, come back to this. Um, uh, yes and no. Uh, and maybe it'll become clear after a couple slides. Um, so the question is, with this model, you know, what do most people, I think you, you heard about a whole bunch of time series databases in this, in this seminar series. Well, what are people using today? And if you actually, this was a, from this year, a survey of a bunch of database users by Percona, which is a kind of big MySQL shop that puts on a big MySQL conference. Basically, 68% of people say they use some type of NoSQL database. And so you could ask, you know, why is this the case? You know, what, did the, what were the database people working on for so long that everybody thinks we should just go to NoSQL? And you know, why not use a simple relational table to solve that? I, I gave you the argument that's a very natural relational model. You know, the answer is the price of Oracle. Well, one's the price of Oracle, but we have these great things like Postgres and MySQL, which is kind of Oracle. So let's talk about Postgres. So this is Postgres. Uh, you know, one of the differences in time series, there's a lot of data compared to uh, sometime you know, your traditional, let's say, how many accounts that the bank has. Uh, this is just a small set. This is the data set going up to 5 million rows. You know, you're inserting one at a time. You'll get better performance in inserting batches. I'll come back to that. But you start out doing basically 15,000 transactions per second. This is a single you know, cloud node, not too powerful, but it looks good. And then you keep doing transactions. The data set gets bigger, and um, it goes off the cliff. Right? And huge variance. You know, this is the, the, the mean. But you know, we actually have these huge bands where a lot of times we're getting these you know, hundreds of transactions a second. What is happening, probably all of you could already detect this. It's not too surprising. Here, think about like a time series order. Time is the primary dimension. You have a B tree on it. But you, know, you want to index data. You want to be able to ask questions about your data. Right? And if you have a single table and you have a B tree index on it, as you insert more data, you're going to want to maintain that B tree. And that is going to insert it in the global order for the sort order of that B tree. Right? So maintaining the index means in the end, you're swapping to disk a lot. So not surprising, you know, memory is a lot faster than disk. And so databases are happy when, the, when their writes are all in memory. And they're really hap unhappy when they're all on, on disk. Uh, this is network attached SSDs, by the way. All the, all the data from, our, from the benchmarks I'll show you are network attached SSDs. So why not just a NoSQL database? You know, what the kind of champion from NoSQL databases for the last, let's say, five, 10 years have been these log structure merge trees. 
I'm not going to talk about the specifics, but the, the way they ultimately end up using is one of the nice things about that. They support range queries over these sorted keys. They often are stored in kind of a, almost a column format when, they, when, they're, when these are used in these type of time series databases. And so you get really nice compression. So that is one you know, bonus for them. And typically what this leads to is I effectively keep a separate column for like the name, this tag set, all that metadata I described, each unique tag set gets kind of stored separately and let's say some numerical value. Now the downside of it, and, and you know, all of these kind of modern NoSQL databases have in the end adopted what effectively is a log structured merge tree. Now in the end is that this does lead to some problems. And if you look at most of them, they actually have very little support for secondary indices because they're primarily storing all the data in that, the order of that key and, and tag set. And particularly what we find is that because the kind of number of, of, of time series they support basically grows with the cross product of the number of distinct items in each, in each that make up the tag set. So if you have a million unique device IDs in a thousand locations and you know, 10 different device types, that's already 10 billion unique combinations. And most of the a lot of these time series databases cannot handle that type of carnality. Right? Because effectively, all of the different uh, index structures for this uh, uh, log structure merge trees have to be maintained in memory. And so what this has led people to is you often think of NoSQL as it gives you flexibility and lets you push off the definition of your schema. But your very choice of which tags you choose has major implications on how you could query your data and how much storage it needs and what you can scale to. That's more of a limitation of these implementations rather than LSDM. Correct. Yeah, so I think it's hard. I'm, I'm trying to dance between uh, the general design of this data structure and an implementation. And you know, I'm, I'm being a little fuzzy there. Um, and often it leads to, does require, or particularly implementation things, a lot of in-memory data structures to support the lookup, lookup structures on each of these. Um, less powerful queries, losses equal ecosystem, and no joins. And so what we set to do, and this is again when we are still building an IoT platform, is we want to try to build a database that could support this high volume of writes, uh, but building it kind of on top of a you know, rock solid relational database. So in fact, we built this on top of Postgres. I mean, you should probably mention what do you mean you lose the SQL ecosystem, because that may not be obvious. Correct. So what I mean by that is that most of these, uh, all these NoSQL databases, they either make up their own language, you know, they have this crazy JSON REST API, or if they're something like Cassandra, they define CQL, or they define something SQL-ish. And what that SQL-ish means, means they could do a simple select statement, but you know, for example, you can't have secret indices, you can't have indexes on numerical values, you could only order by time, you can't have subqueries, you can't do windows, you can't do all that stuff. What that means is if you take a tool that speaks SQL, it won't work with the system. And by the SQL ecosystem, you want is we have across organizations lots of things that speak SQL, ORMs, um, uh, uh, data, uh, ETL systems, visualization layers like Tableau, they all speak SQL. So if you have something that speaks SQL, it could plug in and work hopefully out of the box with any of this, any of this stuff. And that was our goal. And so we built Timescale DB. Uh, and effectively, we built this package as an extension on top of Postgres. Uh, and so effectively, some of the benefits we get are what we engineered, some of the benefits we get from the way we carefully engineer this on top of Postgres. Uh, in particular, I want to stress three things. The easy of use, like I said, supports full SQL. Um, some additional time-oriented features that uh, we add. Uh, you get this one database. You could store relational data in your time series table in the same database. You could do joins across them. You don't have to kind of silo your data. And because it speaks Postgres, you basically get the full ecosystem. Anything that speaks to Postgres basically works out of the box of time scale. In terms of scalability, I'll talk about how we get high write rates, some time-oriented optimizations. In particular, we've had people run, um, basically on a single node, hundreds of billions of rows, uh, individual tables that scale to hundreds of billions of rows. Um, and in terms of reliability, kind of the, the key thing here is we actually, in some sense, uh, if you think about a database as having a front end and a back end, most of our, opti our work is almost all on the front end of Postgres. And we made this strategic decision to basically keep at least for now, like the, 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 the low-level storage engine of Postgres unmodified, because effectively, you know, it takes a long time to make a production-worthy database. And we don't have to 
you know, worry if we have this corner case of the recovery algorithm of the wall correct. We get that from Postgres. And so effectively by doing this though, we inherit again not just the use scenario of Postgres, but the operational scenario of Postgres. So you can use with, you know, PG backup and bouncer and wall replication and wall and all that stuff with the works of Postgres is going to work with time scale. Two questions. Yeah, so if you stick with SQL, sometimes time series processing involves like iterative queries, like if you have like sliding windows or just windows, you want to keep building a model after traversing all the windows. So how would you first express something like that in SQL, or how would you consider like sliding windows or session-based windows with SQL? So there's a couple, two, two answers. One is um, we are adding basically UDFs that are providing new functionality that we don't expose to the user that does stuff like you know, sessionalization and uh, fuzzy joins and various things that you might want. Some of this is like, look, um, if you actually talk to a lot of users, you don't always solve all these problems inside your database. And so there is some support for, in fact, there are other libraries that work with us for machine learning on the database. But if you're doing not machine learning inference, but machine learning training, often what you're doing is you're pulling all the stuff into like, you know, Jupyter or a Python or R notebook. And what you want is just a query, you know, a query into the database, and then you're doing it often elsewhere. So again, it's not trying to though solve all those problems. How the number of features in the data affect your scalability? You mentioned hundreds of billions of rows. Um, uh, Features, could you, columns. columns. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, so this, the limit we found here is just really, um, you know, disk space. This was on 50 to 100 terabytes. Um, clearly, the, all, all the benchmarks I, I'm going to give you have uh, 10 column rows. Clearly, your throughput is going to go down when these are really big or when you have big JSON blobs inside them, but kind of the traditional trade-off, though, you should think of those as the same as you would get from a really small uh, SQL database, Postgres database. We just don't, we just see that same performance at much larger, you know, we don't, we don't hit that bottleneck. I think okay. the limitation of Postgres is the, the tuple has to, all the actors have to fit on a single page. The value Except you have toast, so you could actually. The, 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 when the values go elsewhere, but you can't take a tuple and have half its columns on one page, half the columns on another page. Right? It has to be all together. Okay, so the question is, is, is why do we get better performance than Postgres? We're just building on top of it. And the kind of key insight, perhaps not surprisingly to this very technical audience, is that time series workloads are different. And in particularly they're different because if you look at traditional transactional workloads, you're doing primarily updates. These updates are often randomly distributed amongst your tables. You know, you're doing bank transactions, moving one, one, one row, updating another row. You're often doing transactions to multiple keys. You're touching many things at the same time. With time series workloads, it's mostly a, you know, a append-only workload. It's primary inserts. In particular, it's primary inserts to the recent time interval. And this is the key thing for how we achieve better performance. And often, you know, the writes are kind of associated with some type of like timestamp and maybe some additional keys, but they're not generally transactions to multiple keys as one transactional element. And what this means, so if you look at this kind of picture of, uh, of our time series data, um, what we provide, and this is how we kind of look just like a standard database, we provide what we call as a hyper table. And what this under the covers is we're actually doing kind of heavy partitioning or heavy sharding on this hyper table uh, in one or more dimensions. On a first dimension, perhaps not surprising, is time. And this is either can be in the database manually specified and then changed. So you could say, you could start by saying, you know, the interval is like one hour and later change to 10 minutes if you want. Uh, and we also have a version where the database will automatically adjust the time interval based on its observed data volumes. So it can kind of adapt, maybe not like auto-tune-ish, auto-tune, but it could auto-adjust auto the interval. And the second thing we support is uh, zero more dimensions of, of, of arbitrary dimensions based on column partitioning, either intervals or most time it's hash partitioning. And we call this thing, I'll call this a chunk, but you should think about this is basically stored as a table inside the database. So what does this allow you to do? So the kind of really, what, in a, if you look back at the time series workload, it, when inserts are to latest, primarily to the latest time interval, effectively what it means is there is going to be this wave of data where most of the writes are going to be. 
And so your older data can still exist in the database, but that's not where basically most of the writes are going to. And so that's one way where we optimize for it. We kind of assume that writes are mostly to the latest intervals, although you certainly can store as much data as you want. But the nice thing about this model is we call the hypertable. As a user, all of your interaction with the database is with the hypertable. So when you insert it, when you query it, you just view this as a single, a single table. You don't worry about anything else going on under the covers. And that includes for, you know, for inserts and queries, but it's also when you include indexes, um, you, you, you know, alter the schema of the hypertable, and this naturally propagates all these things to each individual chunk, where these indexes are basically local to this chunk. And that's, again, a key design point. Similarly, constraints, upserts, triggers, all these things are done, interact with the hypertable, and are properly, uh, uh, properly flow down to all these chunks under the covers. So I think you're going to say that you have no focus on uh, reducing the, the uh, summarizing the old data or forcing it out of the database. If the user wants to do this, they can do it, but you would keep everything. Um, we give you that flexibility in that commonly what would happen is, you know, this is an example where it's a raw, you know, it's all your raw data. And um, I'm going to jump ahead like a lot of slides. And you could store this. And the common thing is actually people then, uh, we actually one of the nice things because we support upserts is that uh, this is the upserts provide a very easy way to then roll up data between these separate hypertables. So with us, what we typically have is people could specify you know, three different hypertables. That turns out to be roll-ups or aggregations between um, the smaller thing, and then also specify different data retention policies on each. So you can, in the database, say, keep your raw data for a week, and it will age it out. This is what your question was. Keep an aggregation for longer. But again, that's really just a configuration option up to the user. Correct. An upsert says that if the data does not exist, insert it. Otherwise, update an existing record. And the reason this turns out to be really nice is because it also avoids you to have to ensure that your writer uh, provides exactly one semantics. So what we've often found is that people have actually deployed time scale both on an edge device and in the cloud. And they basically could have their edge device just keep some raw data and every so often just dump up data to the cloud. And yet they don't need to kind of fault tolerate and make sure that each data is inserted exactly once. Similarly, for data aggregation, because you're upserting it, what you could do, in, you, an easy way to handle late data, is at the end of each window, let's say five minutes, you perform an aggregation. Then the next time around, you actually go back 30 minutes and recompute them. There's a couple different ways you could do this with, you could carefully do this with triggers. But this is a kind of a very simple way to basically kind of sweep in late updates to the database. Are you using Postgres as like inheritance, K1 inheritance, to, to have these different um, course grain aggregations? Uh, we use, no, those are just separate tables. We use inheritance in a for our hypertable design, though. Okay. So, uh, under the covers, um, you know, basically data is coming in. You could do one insert. Uh, this could be an individual row, it could be a big batch transaction. The query engine, the execution model will properly take apart a, a batch of inserts, route these tuples effectively to the right subtables. And when you kind of try to write to a new chunk that doesn't exist, the database will dynamically create a new set of chunks and start writing to them. So these partitions or chunks are only created on demand. And you know why this on demand? Now you could say, well, like haven't I mean, even Postgres and protects Postgres 10 has like some nice support for partitioning. And like, you know, a lot of users will do this manually. They'll create a partition per week or per month. Like, doesn't that work? Um, there's a bunch of problems. Some of them have been performance. A lot have been management. But as an example of, of kind of how we're trying to push this, you know, one user, for example, I was talking about, you know, stored 500 billion rows in a single table. Um, he was getting, for Postgres, I know, you know, Dave builds stuff. Dave, Dave laughs at this. He says, my systems do 50 million inserts a second. But you know, they're doing 400,000 uh, rows per second into the, into the relational database. And the key thing is they, under the covers, have 50,000 chunks. Right? So if you think about like, a normal uh, sharding and a partitioning database, you're not running this thing with 50,000 chunks, probably two orders of magnitude less. 
And in fact, the database here is dynamically creating a chunk every few minutes. So this, is this is 400K with you. Sorry? This is 400K rows per, 400K inserts per second with time scale. With time scale. Yeah, Postgres is not doing that. Correct. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, this is time scale. This is on Postgres, but you know, yeah, this, yeah. Is, this, is, this is time scale. Okay, so what are these benefits of chunking? I've kind of stressed this. And the key thing about what we want our chunks is we want these chunks to be right-sized. And by that, I effectively mean that the latest several intervals, one or more intervals, basically fit in memory, right? And that is what allowed us to basically keep this insert rate, provided, again, that your t workload has the feature that most of these writes are going to this latest interval, right? The second thing it leads to, and this is related to your question about uh, aging out, is that it leads to actually efficient retention policies. Because when you actually, ha in us, when you say drop, a, drop data over a certain <laughs> interval, it's actually not, what it's doing is actually looking for each chunk, and it will only delete the chunk if all of the rows are over that interval. So if you say drop something more than a week, and this is a chunk that spans data from like a week plus six hours and a week minus six hours, it's not going to delete it until all the stuff is over that time interval. And then what that means is in order to drop data, you're never deleting rows. You're just basically dropping chunks, which means you're just deleting files on disk. So it's kind of much more efficient. And again, because you're not uh, deleting rows, you don't actually basically fragment your tables. You don't have to run these expensive vacuumings. And that kind of keeps management much faster. Can you do updates on? Yes. You can do updates. It's just that if you're, yeah, we, we allow you to do updates just that your performance will, not, if, if you, you turn update heavy, the performance is just going to kind of, insert performance is going to drop down to a, a little faster, no, faster than Postgres, but not that type of performance that we saw before. Because it's going to be swapping to disk a lot. But are you doing in place updates versus like? Uh, yes, okay. we are doing in place so updates. Correct. We are doing in-place updates. Um, our inserts, though, to each chunk are not are actually in the insert order. They're not in time order. You could build an index on top of that, but the insert itself to individual it finds the right chunk, but then just inserts in right order. Um, the other big thing that we do is we talk about tuple routing, but one of the kind of on the query side, a lot of that was how do you make inserts fast? You kind of mostly are inserting to chunks stored in memory, and the indexes on top of those chunks are all local to that index. So the index is all in memory. On the query side. Uh, what we actually do is we do kind of aggressive constraint exclusion. So when we have 50,000 chunks and you give us a SQL query, we kind of use the various constraints like what is time and what are these additional dimensions that you queried on to quickly prune which of these chunks we need to touch. So rather than having to t touch all of them, you know, we see that, oh, this one only talked about this device ID, it maps to this hash partition, let's just now do the query, let's push down the query to these partitions, not all of the data. And similarly, you could slice across time and various things. Now, the interesting thing, again, kind of a minor point, but turns out to in practice matter a lot, is that we kind of have a rich notion of time. So does anybody want to tell me what the difference between these two calls are? Well, one's not deterministic. <laughs> True, but why does that matter a lot? One's a, uh, one, one's a range of one. This is me being professorial. I'm cold calling on the audience, right? No. Is it one, one's a range and one is... Uh, no, this is, this, this should, this, look, it's now minus 24 hours. It seems like it's a fixed point. So it should be dynamically ordered to different chunks, I guess. This again is, I mean, both of these are basically like, you know, imagine this is time is greater than this thing. And when a human looks at this, they should be like, time should be greater than a certain point. What's the problem? I think you, in the second one, you already know which chunks that you want to look Static this is static? Uh, no, the next one. But I think in the first one, this one, you always change the... It cha as, as you keep doing it, changes. That's not the, that's not the problem. If we're doing pre-processing, you could have a static value and have pre-knowledge of what you're doing, whereas the now has to be evaluated at some point, and you can't do anything before that. Yes, yeah, so the problem is that the planner is going to execute this, and the planner wants to also have some prepared statements in SQL. And so now cannot be executed at planning time. It has to be executed at execution time. And similarly, even if you made this a date, it still breaks, because the database, Postgres, is very conservative. And Postgres doesn't know that the time between when you plan the query, prepare the query, and when you execute it, the, the time zone of your server could have changed. And this is dependent on the time zone of where you're executing the server. So when you run this in Postgres, it's going to touch all the chunks. 
and you're going to be very unhappy. But we have a strong notion of time, so actually these type of things, we actually move into the execution um, engine. So we actually move them out of the planner and constify them in the execution time, rebuild the query plan. It's these little tweaks that, from a research perspective, don't seem very interesting, but turn out to make a big difference when you're trying to use the system in practice. That, that's elimination of Postgres. That's not. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what the other. I don't know what the other databases do. Like if you if the planner is transactional, you have, you know the timestamp. Like the now is when the transaction starts. <coughs> Postgres knows that too. I don't know why, but the, the planner is different. But like. If you go into the planner in, in the context of a transaction, you would know what the timestamp is and you could do this. And if someone changes the time, changes the time zone, that's still outside. If you're doing snapshot isolation outside of your transaction, you, you wouldn't see that. Um, it, it's a limitation of what it's doing inside the planner and what it's doing inside the execution engine. Right. What, no, Postgres is being correct that it's actually pushing this to the execution engine. The, the pro, I guess this is an implementation detail. Yeah. The problem is constraint exclusion and generating the query plan, which is what constraint exclusion is, is done at the planning time, not at execution time. Anyway, it, it's just, just a detail. So um, I want to talk about uh, two other things which allows us to do. And in fact, the open source version of, of Timescale just runs on a kind of a, a, a single node currently. But the interesting thing is that even on a single node, and all performance numbers I'm going to give you are, are with respect to that node, is that we allow you to actually kind of scale up by elastically adding more disks even to a single table, which is kind of strange. So you can do this normally by RAID, and that is you're moving the elasticity to your storage system. And I, I think a lot of people here know about how to build uh, parallel, like good storage systems. But you know, Postgres and some other things have this notion of table spaces. And what a table space is basically a mount point that, and you could map a table to a certain disk mount point. Now, what we allow you to do is actually add many table spaces to a single hypertable. Because of course, implementation-wise, under the covers, a, a hypertable is just an abstraction. And what we'll do is, as you elastically add a table space, as new intervals get created, they get created load balanced across all the new disks. This is particularly nice, because as you age out new data, as you age out old data, you're basically, ela it's kind of a different way to do elasticity. Normally by elasticity you need to migrate data. Here you're relying on your workload pattern to now write this new data across your disks. And there's other benefits obviously about adding disks and that faster inserts and parallel queries. Now, I'll come back to your question in a minute. Uh, one thing I'm working on a major kind of um, development thing for this next year is really to then scale out to many servers. And, you know, usually there's this big gap when you take a database from one server to many servers. The interesting thing is, like, our in, even from a query model and from an insert model, our individual servers is, is you know, pretty aggressively paralyzed already. And certainly there are some things we need to work on, some new issues that we're doing to take it out to many servers. But kind of, like, the, a lot of the query path kind of already exists today in how we built even a single server. Was there a question? Could you repeat what time? Sorry, table space is just the name in Postgres that effectively is a disk mount point. You basically say, um, here's the mount point for this table. And you'll find, file, you find serialized and stored copies of the database contents. Yes, it, it, you map a table, which is a file, and that gets written to that, to that mount point. Um, in the cloud, this is particularly nice because you then can like, mount a network attached EBS volume to that thing. And so you're kind of like, what does elastically adding disks to a machine mean? Well, it doesn't mean much when it's on a rack, but when it's in the cloud, it means you basically just like connect a new EBS volume and kind of keep going. Um, yeah. Uh, the other neat thing about po one thing in Postgres, it even allows you, for example, put indexes in, in your storage on different table spaces. So you, for example, put your indexes on SSDs and your storage on like HDDs. So, uh, what is the scenario in which inserts happen to an older time uh, time region? Time regions. Uh, it, de it depends on your workload. I mean, some late data, if you have sensors, let's say some report late, um, in some financial applications, the market corrects itself. So you do this trading thinking the market, the price of the stock was this, and then a, month, a week later, some research arm says, oh yeah, we kind of screwed up that price, it actually is this. Um, they often store both values, they call this bitemporal analysis, but you're often storing that to the old, you know, in us, that's a timestamp from an old, old value. So it really depends on, you know, your workload. That was one, and, but you also said that you insert in the right order as opposed to the time order. So insert is a two-step process. The first thing we do is kind of decide all these kind of chunks are disjoint in time and additional dimensions. Let's just think of time. So the disjoint. So we first say, which is the right chunk? This is the chunk from now to five minutes ago. Then inside that region, we're writing to disk just when it's 
the, at the end of that region. So it, we don't have to actually pay the cost of sorting out of order data when you write. Are you making any assumptions about you know, the, uh, the frequency with which you collect data? No. Uh, people do it regularly, irregularly. Uh, let me come back to that. Um, and that's actually the next couple slides. Why don't we, um, let me move on a little bit just to make sure we get to some of these. But um, yeah, so how do exactly do we partition? I think some of your questions are like, how do we partition on time? And there's actually some interesting issues here. Um, and a lot of this is related to until you start thinking about it, early and late data actually affects a lot of things. So it's not really the frequency, but it's actually the out of orderness of the data actually has some important implications. So what you'd say is like, well, if you're, end goal is we want this stuff to fit in memory. Let's just fit the target size. Let's just say, you know, we have X amount of memories, let's make chunks one gigabyte, right? Except I have this property of disjointness. So we say, well, one gigabyte is probably, let's say a day or a minute, whatever, it doesn't matter. So it's one gigabyte, but it's gonna be roughly a day. Um, the problem is if you are fitting its size and let's say you have early data, because if you have a big enough system, you can't ever rely on your client clocks. So there's going to be some clocks that are completely out of sync, right? And you look at this chunk, you've only written you know, 20 megs of the one gig. You get this thing in, you say, there's plenty of room. Let's extend the range, the time range of that chunk to hold this data. Except the problem with that data just came early. And so what happened is as the start getting in, in order, it starts getting much too large. And then you're, again, out of luck. You know, the things like spanners suggest that you can pay money and get better clock sync if you want it. Sure, sure. So, so the price of the value of this is compared to the price. Well, this is the, the so uh, Spanner paid money to make their cloud thing synchronize. Uh, streaming systems uh, often cheat with this, that they timestamp things when they arrive. A lot of times what you want to timestamp thing is when the event was generated. If you're an IoT, you're thinking about like this little device on the edge. Most of these systems include Google Cloud data flow and yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, so what about static duration? Just make it a, a fixed time. Um, and, and actually you find operationally like people like this. People like, even though they shouldn't, they still like to say a chunk is about a day. One of the other reasons is if they often know the range of their queries and you roughly align those two things, it could allow you to minimize the number of chunks you touch. The downside is, you know, you hopefully, well, if you're in certain areas, like if you're a startup, you hopefully have more and more users. If you have sensor networks you, or, or, or IoT, you hopefully have more and more devices. And so as your data volumes change, you know, if you have a fixed interval, that could, again, make the chunks too large. Um, so what we also support, uh, what we, we do support, this is probably the most common use case, although we allow you to manually change the s intervals of the chunk over time. That's a manual process. Um, it's just a system call. But what we also do is we uh, allow to perform adaptive interval. And this is what I was talking before. And so what this is effectively going to do is going to look at the range of an individual chunk. And effectively, it's almost like a hysteresis, a high watermark, a low watermark. As it decides that the volume of data is, is increasing, it's going to tr shrink the range of future time intervals. Uh, and similarly, what this means is though that early data will, be, will not greatly expand this chunk and will be placed in a proper chunk that you pre pre-generate out there. So there's kind of, this kind of gives you the best of both. Um, you know, partitions are created with a fixed time interval, but the, the system will dynamically adapt. Um, we'll see how much people actually use this in practice. Um, my guess is that most will actually prefer to maintain it manually. Um, I, think, uh, I think people in general are, are leery about letting systems auto-tune themselves. Um, but this is a long-term bet. So, are, are, are you essentially doing compaction, or like, are you going back and, and combining these things together? We don't currently go back and resize chunks. It would be a relatively easy operation to do transactionally. Okay. And we have that capability, we just don't do it automatically. Okay, so let me give some graphs. So, you saw this graph before where Postgres went off a cliff. Um, this is up to uh, 250 million rows. Uh, single row inserts, time scale is maintained this really nice um, performance throughout. It's paying a little extra cost up front because it has just a more complex insert pipeline than a single table. If, however, we take this to uh, batch inserts, which is, again, um, pretty common actually in many time series environments, um, this is what we look to about a billion rows. 
Um, Postgres quickly goes off a cliff. They both, in batch mode, they're both starting about 120,000 inserts per second. Um, we just, Azure gives, Azure servers are not as good as that, that uh, companies I showed you before. Um, but what you see is out here, you get this you know, pretty significant performance gap on the insert side. If you were a, um, by the way, if you were a, uh, from, a uh, from a DevOps perspective, you often talk about metrics, not uh, rows. These are 10 columns per row, so this would be about 1.2 million metrics per second. Query performance. Um, table scans compared to Postgres are roughly similar or a little bit faster because of smaller indexes. I said roughly because the one thing we do is we pay a little, we pay extra in planning cost. So we'll probably add maybe an extra millisecond of planning cost compared to native Postgres, but you know, often make that up big in the execution time. Is that because you have an extra step after the go through the optimizer? Or Just because, I mean, you know, there's 50,000 chunks that you're dealing with. Um, so just doing constraint exclusion, you know, we, I mean, that's all written by us. It's all in C. It's, it's pretty optimized. You probably could do it more, but you know, it's just more stuff than. So like you, you modified the Postgres optimizer to include now invoking your part. Not... Yeah. So what happens? You get this query parse in, you get this, the, the query parse tree comes in. We quickly detect that it's a hyper table in the case we grab it. If it's not a hyper table, we pass it through to the rest of the Postgres system. Um, in the optimizer, we haven't, I mean, we haven't changed that much of the query optimizer. But the, I mean, the planner just has a lot more steps because there's, it's dealing with inheritance on like all these thousands of tables and we have some code for constraint exclusion and all that stuff. Um, I think the biggest thing where you see is a lot of times when you have, A, you're dealing with small indexes, but group buys and like time ordered group buys, you see this huge performance improvement, right? This is actually a very, and remember I talked about deletions before being more efficient because again, they're, they're file deletions, not, not, not row deletions, but time ordered group buys. So this is a, a common example. This is a super common query that you see in, in many type of, of, dashboard, of dashboarding and time series. You know, it's saying, you know, do, give me the average value over a minute. You know, group by minute, order by minute descending, and give me the last 10 values. This is like what every dashboard is doing, right? The problem is, you have an index on time. This is an abstract function from the perspective of the, the, um, planner and optimizer. So it doesn't know how to handle this. And so Postgres and I think a lot of databases wouldn't know how to handle this. Again, because we have a notion of time, we you know, have a notion of how all these things do, so we make sure to handle this kind of the way you want to. Do you special, special case like extract the trunk? We special case some of them, but we also have more semantics on what, uh, if it, perhaps if it's a timestamp, we have semantics on what, how timestamps are behaved, if it's an integer, in, in a time column that's specified, we kind of know certain semantics around how we inserted it. Do you maintain separate statistics on like pre-computer, like pre-computing minute buckets? I don't think currently. Okay. I, not definitive though. Okay. I don't think so. Um, now you could say, what about NoSQL? Uh, this is Cassandra. Um, Cassandra just actually turns out not to be that fast. Um, this is, I'm writing this now in metrics per second, but you know, this is a 10x performance gap when obviously Cassandra can't do all the queries. The query model is very slow. Cassandra is a column store, um, but it turns out kind of. Column family. Column family. But it turns out it's not all that good at it, maybe. Um, this is on video. <laughs> I said nothing about commercial versions of Cassandra. Um, <laughs> uh, time order queries, again, much faster. Uh, last point, uh, this is a very common query in IoT and in finance. It's give me the last reading for this distinct item. So if you have a bunch of devices, what's the last reading for this device? Or what's the last e reading for this stock ticker? Um, again, kind of much more performant. So now, if it is a Postgres audience, maybe that's not a lot of this, but the, the natural thing is, but it hasn't Postgres 10 solved all this problem. They have this awesome thing called uh, declarative partitioning, aren't all those issues that you talked about partitioning in Postgres, those performance numbers were all from a single table of Postgres compared to time scale. So it wasn't using a lot of partitioning itself. Um, so let's just look at it. So in batch mode, um, this is X, the XX is the number of partitions in the database. Um, you know, I, I think this is again designed for these type of logical partitioning was designed for you have it per day. 
you don't have this thing every five minutes with many dimensions on top. So this is with batch, you know, we're, we're seeing big performance. If you are doing single row, um, that's the kind of performance of time scale versus Postgres. This is really just not optimized. Again, these are all, some of these are implementation issues, but they are not at all optimized for having a large number of tables. Because again, I think as a general purpose database as opposed to a time series database, you're optimizing for kind of very different things. Now, the other thing I want to point out in that, this is true amongst a lot of these databases as well, in that these often try to give great flexibility to the user kind of as the cost of ease of use and, some, and a lot of flexibility, or in a lot of scenarios. So the way you do it in a lot of these things where you manually partition or, or specify declarative partitionings is you kind of build your own tree. So in Postgres 10, for example, you might, this is kind of the actual syntax, you might take a table, a main table, they use inheritance, and you create a bunch of partitions, and let's say we do, we, we want to, they don't yet support hash partitioning, but let's say we want to do range partitioning over the alphabet, over four things. And then if you want to do, again, time partitioning, you actually define these as children each of those, so you have a data structure like this. Right? Alternatively, you could have turned it, or, and then you have to manually build indexes on each of these things, and then kind of, this is all, again, kind of pretty manual. Um, you could have flipped it around. You could have done time and devices first, but it's this hierarchical notion of partitioning. The problem is, if I ever, I talked before about wanting to, let's say, change your time intervals because of if changing data volumes. Like, you can't really do this here because of this thing. And similarly here, you don't have flexibility of ever changing the number of, time, of device dimensions because you need, again, better locality. So it kind of restricts you once you, once you set it. Um, this is uh, time scale syntax. Um, it's basically uh, create a hypertable, conditions, uh, this is the time dimension, this is the device dimension, and it's basically going to create a flat structure. Right? And this allows us to then over time to tune these in any way, and it's going to um, you know, not have any kind of ordering problems. And similarly, everything I talked about before, indexes and all this, kind of are pushed down automatically. You don't build them manually on each of the children. And if you look back at these, these are some of the properties I said before. You know, PG10 basically either doesn't do these or makes them really hard. And so it kind of, I think this is really because it kind of focused, again, a general relational database is focusing on trying to have flexibility in general cases while we're kind of tra tackling a particular use case and kind of optimizing for that. So um, let me finish up with just a couple more slides. Um, you know, I talked about this allows you to join. We do add some additional, let's say, features, kind of type of analysis, time bucketing, different functions that you don't find in, in a normal database. Um, we allow you to track uh, people's uh, GPS coordinates um, in case you want to follow them. Um, but in seriousness, in seriousness, what we found in a common use case, for example, in IoT is what I'd call kind of geospatial temporal analysis. Um, this is the actual real user's use case. Uh, let's look at the amount of tonnage coming in and out of the Port of Los Angeles uh, each day. We're going to use it to predict um, what the market's going to do a month from now. Um, and you know, the nice thing about the way we built it, because it's an extension on, on Postgres, it plays friendly with other Postgres extensions. So PostGIS is this GIS extension on top of Postgres. And uh, you know, they, look, they work together. Um, get JSON, I talked about this, and kind of end with, you know, and kind of stress, stress the last point, because to basically do all this engineering to make that hypertable look like a standard table, then kind of that entire ecosystem just worked out of the box. It's open source. Please download it, play it, play with it. Uh, we have a very active Slack channel if you have any questions and want to ask, ask for help. Otherwise, as a great audience, we are hiring <laughs> aggressively uh, in New York and Stockholm uh, for core database engineers, R&D, support engineers, and a bunch of other people. What's the flight time between Stockholm and... Seven hours. <laughs> it's a great place to live. New York, though, is, I don't know, maybe even better. <laughs> any, question, any more questions? Uh, let's thank Mike. Time for a couple questions. You mentioned that millisecond uh, during planning, um, but that depends on the number of chunks you end up having. Um, and you mentioned that the millisecond is referenced to 50,000 chunks or so. 
Um, would you say that this is a typical data set you see with people using this? No, 50,000 is on the, definitely on the high end. Okay. It's definitely on the high end, yeah, yeah. But, but this, how does this time scale with the amount of data you're collecting? Uh, uh, so the question is, how does, I mentioned about a millisecond of planning time, uh, how does that scale with the amount of data? Planning time is really a function of the type of query, right? Um, you know, in, in general for your relation. Uh, how complex, you know, is this a query inside a subquery with distinct things and CTEs and, I mean, it's, like, this is anything you write, like you could have a, a page long weird auto-generated SQL code from your random BI logic from the 90s and it should run. So some of those queries could look really weird. Okay. Uh, so how do you ensure the consistency, the transaction consistency of the metadata associated with the chunks, especially while that to be chunking things? Yeah, so we create chunks, we create chunks transactionally and um, we uh, don't, one of the reasons they're distinct, we don't change the meta, the metadata here effectively, the important metadata are basically related to the constraints. So related to like the time interval and other types of partitionings. Um, we both maintain our, our own metadata that we use for an optimized path. We actually also store those actually as constraints in Postgres as this, in some sense double level of security, um, but new uh, tables are, new intervals are created transactionally with a lock and, and so forth. Yes, so I'm curious when you were talking about that if you have a and, and sorry, and they don't change once they're created. Yes, so, so I'm curious when you were talking about the date trunk function, and when you, when you were saying in Postgres when you have a date trunk, then it doesn't know what it is, so it couldn't really plan it and time scale understanding. So I guess my question is a little bit related to the implementation. Basically, when you say time scale understanding, where, where does this happen? I would like a tweak the planning of the of your query or you tweak the optimizer or you rewrite the query before you even plan it. So there's a couple the question was how does Postgres how does time scale know about day trunk? Um, there's a couple different thing different things that were going on. Um, I believe for date trunk and we have a much more flexible version of this is time bucket with day trunk only lets you chunk by minute or hour or whatever. Um, we do special case some of the, the easiest thing is we special case some of those functions so that the um, basically planner has knowledge of what to do. Uh, so that it could know that basically the output, effectively we know that the thing is order preserving so that the input of this thing has a certain order in the index and the output of it will also maintain that order. Okay, but before query optimization? Uh, I think so. Uh, I hired a heart. It was a question of do we have chunk level compression? Uh, we have not yet implemented any native compression in the, in the database. Um, what we uh, have done and what we found some of the users do is actually run this on top of ZFS and have gotten roughly about 3 to 4x compression. So you mentioned you built indexes for each hyper uh, table chunks. Uh, so I think it makes sense for like new chunks because it's update heavy. Have you considered building global indexes for older chunks? Okay, so there's two, you asked, we uh, create indexes. So by default, I will say that when you create a hyper table, you could turn this off, but it will create some default indexes based on time. Um, we allow you to, like any other, like a lot of relational tables, we allow you to add new indexes, drop them, you know, B-trees, gin, Brin, gist, whatever type of hash, whatever type of indexes will will support that. Um, we allow you to reindex and cluster after time. The one thing we do not support is global indexes over all the data, and so this is a kind of a key design point in that uh, the prim effectively the unique constraint. If you define something as unique or a primary key, uh, we require that unique values uh, have a prefix that is similar to the partitioning function of the database. So for example, if you partition by time, we require that your primary key or anything declared unique has to have time as a prefix. It could be additional, it could be composite. What that means is then we don't think, we don't support global index. And so again, queries and lookups are this two-state process. You first time the thing, and the index is just local. Got it. Thanks. So I have two questions. Do your specialized UDFs that you provide, are they written in C or PLPG SQL? Um, both, they are increasingly moving to C. Okay. 
So anything, anything performant, performance driven, we're doing in C. Got it. And then the second question is like, from an overall engineering question, like, are you bait, are you following along like the Cygus guys as as always upgrading Postgres every time to put a new version out, or are you fixed at some particular version in the past? Like, what is what's the strategy there? Yeah. So we will. We are following. We are upgrading. I mean, Citus was a fork. Initially, they moved to an extension. Yeah. They were initially a fork, which created that other problem. We've always been an extension. Um, this week or early next week, we're releasing support for Postgres 10, actually. And so we are. There's. It's already on master. You can check it out now. But uh, yeah, we are supporting upgrades because users support upgrades. Or you. Sorry, we are providing support for currently 9, 6, and 10. And we will continue to support things, things moving, multiple versions moving forward. I mean, the core stuff, like the hypertables, that's all sort of separate from the rest of the system. So that, that doesn't really change. But anything that you have to interject in like the planner or stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, obviously software, there's obviously some messiness when you're looking to support multiple versions because your tie in points change. Uh, in fact, the biggest, this is always funny, the biggest uh, frustration about upgrading to PG10 was they changed the formatting of the outputs of slash of, 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 of their print printfs of, of the tables, which mentioned that you had to like special case for a lot of your unit testing. <laughs> Just nastiness. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Because users will upgrade between versions and you need to support both. You mentioned um, sort of query time to show comparisons. Um, like one thing that I wanted to ask is how fast are joins um, like in you know between two time series for example? Yeah. And so you don't have to do anything special for that. Yep. Uh, currently, you do not have to do anything special. The question was, how fast are joins between two hypertables? Um, the, the answer is, you do not need to do anything special. It works. Currently, we have not optimized, basically localized joins when the, when the, t when the chunks are overlapping. So uh, it, is not, it is slower because it's basically kind of pushing everything to memory. One last question. Is there time? Yeah, one more question. The Postgres books expressed any interest in adopting your chunking ideas for non-time series? Uh, the Postgres. The question is: Has Postgres uh, thought of adopting our chunking ideas for nine non-time series data? Um, the Postgres community, first of all, has been super supportive. Actually, we're kind of engaged with them closely. We talk a lot about PG conferences and other other things. Um, I don't think it actually makes sense to, for them to do, um, uh, and really because their goal is to focus on this flexibility. And we're really special casing for our workloads. And so you know, we're, we have a lot of code and a lot of changes. We rewrote the whole insert path, a bunch of query stuff. It's just something that I don't think makes sense to you know, push upstream into, main, into mainline. I'll say also, there's a lot of like, disaster recovery tools that look at directly on the pages of the database. And like, all, you have to rewrite all those if you want to switch over to new format. All right, let's thank Mike again. All right, I want to thank everyone coming this semester. Uh, we had a bunch of great talks in time series databases. Uh, all the videos for these are on YouTube. Uh, so that's it for this semester. Uh, we'll do this again fall 2018. I don't know what the topic is will be at that, that point. Uh, and if you want to know more about why you know these old systems, I'm just say Postgres, but these older database systems are slow and how to build an unoptimized database system, come take the advanced class in the spring. Okay? Or go work at time scale. Alright? Thanks guys, thanks for coming. Thanks. <laughs>